Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Jack Ravel Show. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Eden Blackman onto the show with me. Hey, Eden, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jack. Thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely welcome. Now, today we are talking about something that is been safe to say quite a long long road for you specifically, Eden. But it's it's come to a finally come to an end, and and it's at the point where I think we're ready to dive a bit deeper into it in terms of a whole overview picture of it would I, would, would you agree yeah absolutely it's been um if i was putting a time on it it's probably been around three years and um i'm delighted to talk about it today i'm delighted to get the opportunity to sort of share with somebody who's you know in a very unique situation has actually been on the show that i was part of um so um yeah i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to sort of sharing my experience and, and, and seeing if it resonates with you know your listeners which hopefully it will absolutely i'm sure it will so let's just set the scene for people listening so celebrities go dating was a show that you started and were, were the, the the host of uh, back in was it 2016 it started yeah celebs go dating was 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 started uh we started filming july 2016 uh it aired in the august for three weeks and then i i went on to do another four series till uh march 2018 yeah fantastic and just just for for context how how did you get to become the person who hosted such an amazing show yeah yeah Yeah. well we i simply in a very short kind of um story i what i had a dating app and and i when i was setting it up a very good friend of mine is fern cotton um, and I knew her from Radio 1. She, she used to live just down the road and we used to get tattooed at the same place with so many things in common we didn't realise until we got to know each other. And I was telling her about this dating app and she's got God, you've got to do TV, you've got to do TV, you'd be great for TV. You know, the dating agents, dating experts at that point were humanly female and they're of a certain age and they didn't really resonate, as she put it, with the millennials, mm-hmm. um, particularly the guys. And... Um, Fern essentially is, is respons- entirely responsible for getting me on TV uh, <laughs> because um, she sat down with Holly uh, Willoughby and said, uh, you should do something on the show on This Morning with Dating and I've got the guy to do it. And she showed Holly some pictures of me and uh, got me to record a video. I didn't know what it was for. And that was the Sunday. And um, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Fern texts me and goes, I've just seen F- Holly. She loves what she's seen she'll be in touch. I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> and then Tuesday, the exec from the show emailed me when we're doing a piece on Thursday about online dating, would you come on? And that was my first ever TV. It was, it was 10 minutes of live TV. And um, I joked that for the first two minutes of it, I think only dogs could hear what I was saying because I was so nervous and my, my voice was so high. <laughs> <laughs> that I generally think only kind of like two hours are like, what's that noise? Good here. <laughs> um, and then it kind of moved on to other stuff. And then, you know, I, I did, I've done this morning a bunch of times and, and the news, the Channel 4 News and Channel 5 News. And I'm trying to think what else I've done, kind of decent TVs. And then I was in my office, May 2016, and the phone rang from a number I didn't know. And I picked it up and there's a lady on the phone saying, hi, my name's uh, Rihanna from Lion Pictures, we're putting together a new show called Celebs Go Dating. And she told me the the idea of it. And she asked me what my thoughts on it were. And um, the next thing I know, I'm being invited in for a meeting. The next thing I know, I'm invited into a bunch of screen tests. And then the next thing I know, I'm being introduced to other people that could be co-hosts. There were three of them, three females, Nadia being one of them. And I think that began, I'm gonna say, middle of june and we started filming middle of july gosh quick turnaround that was how quick it was kind of i knew i was still learning you know everyone's name including producers directors and camera assistants and you know the only names i really knew were tom and nadia because they were the people that you were working really closely and then it aired uh bank holiday weekend the monday carnival weekend i live in the middle of carnival and i kind of went to carnival and came back and and watched myself on tv which is quite nuts and then it just exploded the show was the most successful debut series channel four have had since the in-betweeners um and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger gosh that is a quick turnaround for something that has 
you know, gone on to be, as you said, a very successful show. And, and I think at one point it was the, the most successful show they had on, on TV, you know, as mm. well as the debut. And, uh, and so that's, and that's a testament to, you know, your, your ability to be able to bring people together on TV in a way that was entertaining for some, but also potentially, you know, setting people up for the long, long, long haul. Mm. And I mean, I know as, as a firsthand uh, experience of, of, of yeah. that, you know, being on the show, that's where we met. And I think it was, mm. I, I love the experience. I think it was a wonderful, wonderful place and uh, it had a lot of fun on it. But the problem with being on TV and being in the limelight, so to speak, is that there, there does come some, some negatives with it. And, you know, the thing that I think we're going to focus on mostly today is, is I suppose, the, 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 the topic of internet trolling, fake accounts, mm. lies, people pretending to be people that are not. And would you like to just, for the sake of people listening that maybe don't know your story from, from start to finish, just tell us kind of what happened, where, where, where it all started to go, sort of go, go wrong from such a great mm. start to a show? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've always said that I think myself, Nadia and Tom did a brilliant job on the show. I, I share the success and the accolades and the criticism that we got uh, equally because um, I think we were an equal part, a third for the show. Um, my time on, on series one was good, where I met you. It was, it was all completely brand new. We'd, we'd I say we started filming it in the July. I didn't actually get to see an episode until the night it went out on, on Bank Holiday Monday. And I remember going in the next day and going, okay, that's how, <laughs> that's how you want it to look. Because you film, as you know, you film, you know, you'd have Joey Essex come in for an hour and they'd show a minute a minute and a half of that you know you've got no grasp of of what it's meant to look like or how it's set and um i actually didn't think that i would be um rehired for series two because uh, i didn't think i was that good i thought nadi was brilliant and i've always said that um and i thought tom was tom you know what can you say um and i remember sitting down with an exec uh for a cup of tea and they said you know we want to talk to you about series two and I'd, I'd spoken to a couple of people and said you know just friends I don't think I'm going to get series two and they sat down again right it's a hit you know series two you ready and I'm like oh okay I was really really surprised and, and quite humbled that they actually thought I was I did a decent job so that was series one series two um where the hell was series two I have to do it by location Series two. Oh yeah, I know where we were. Um, that was, I felt more confident actually doing series two. That was the series where we had people like, um, oh God, Perry. Uh, was Perry? Yeah, Perry from um, uh, Diversity. Um, Jonathan Chebin, um, Melody from Pussy Cats Dolls, um, Georgie Porter. It was a real kind of good fun people. And I felt a lot more confident doing the show because I got an idea of what it was meant to be. Um, and I felt that my relationship with Nadia was and would always be a working relationship um, in the sense that, you know, we all work with probably some people, hundreds of people. And I, you know, I've got a separate business and I work in music and I work probably with a thousand people, you know, between labels, management, artists, whoever across, you know, whole, all my artists. And I'd probably say of those thousand people, I'd say 10 of them are friends. And I mean that in the sense that friends, you know, working relationships, two very different things. And I s definitely got the impression that Nadia felt it was going to move on to more than being a working relationship. And that for me with, with the character that Nadia is and, and the things that she aspires to and, and, and reacts to just she's not a person that I would uh, socialize with. And I mean that in the sense that, you know, when, whenever we did anything together, it was always a Channel 4 or E4 related um, evening. Um, I don't think, I didn't know Nadia. Um, like I said a moment ago, I met Nadia for the first time, I think in the second or screen third, uh, the second or third screen test. And um, I thought she was, seemed quite nice um a little attention seeking a little loud um and loved to be the center of attention which 
that also aren't three things that I particularly gravitate to in individuals. Um, but I kind of noticed in series two, certainly going into series three, that there was a desire from Nadia to be famous, to be in the papers, to be courting publicity, and fun, particularly across social media. Um, I naturally would follow Nadia and I'd follow Celebs Go Dating and Tom and the other celebrities on social media. And I just found what Nadia would do to get attention on social media, very confrontational, very argumentative conversations about anything. I just found it a little bit attention seeking and I didn't, it didn't really appeal to me. Um, and it got to the stage where I was just sort of seeing this on my timeline all the time and, and working with her and, and, and hearing her on the phone to people. And there was a real excitement, like a kind of a very teenage excitement when a celebrity would come in. Um, and I've said this before, and I, I, and I mean this in a real true lifestyle sense. You know, I've, wor I've worked in music for 30 years um uh, my company you know a pr artist like janet jackson and jennifer lopez and and spent time with people like that and actresses like Lu lucy lou that have been on records that i've worked and um there's only a few times that i've got really excited or starstruck i mean when i worked with janet jackson uh, you know i was really quite nervous and it was only a couple of years ago i wasn't 20 i was like i think i was you know just 50 51 or something and I was really you know wow it's, ja it's Janet Jackson I mean you know so what I mean by that is you know I've worked in an industry for 30 years where I'd met famous people and I probably freaked out on meeting five of them I'm like Jimmy Page you know I'm a big rock fan and a big Led Zeppelin fan when I worked with him and I was at EMI I really did was like well you know I was virtually shaking when I met the guy you know I'm not, I'll be completely honest and um, so I didn't have that kind of fawning or like overt excitement when Fern McCann would come in. And she's, Fern's a lovely girl, you know, I wouldn't have anything against her at all. And I think what she's been through and come out the end is, is, is staggering. Um, but it just wasn't, I wouldn't scream when they came in. And, and I found this from Nadia and I found it, it was like, it was kind of like brossettes or like take that fans. It was this, and I just found it a bit too much. And other people have found it a bit too much. And I'm sat next to her on a sofa here and I do this all the time. And, 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 and then with her social media getting so sort of really aggressive and really nasty, really confrontational, I decided between series two and series three that I was going to unfollow her on social media because I just didn't want to see her sort of toxicity and, and nastiness and, and just the way that she would be so overtly offensive and argumentative for no reason. And I decided to unfollow her. I was under kind of no contract to follow her. It was, you know, simply just to see what she was saying. And when I saw what she was saying for a long time, I made a decision to stop follow her. And Nadia then some time after noticed that I'd unfollowed her. And the only way I can describe it, Jack, was she lost her shit. And she lost her shit. Am I allowed to swear? Sorry, she lost. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, she just went bananas. Um, I got a bunch of, of, of text messages on a Sunday accusing me of all sorts of things and how how heartless that was that I hadn't replied to her immediately. The fact that when she texted me, I was doing a radio show, actually DJing a radio show, producing the show, doing all the desk entirely on my own. The last thing I'm doing when I'm doing a radio show is responding to people on text. And particularly when it's no idea when you need, it's gonna be a long conversation. I didn't wanna do anything flippant. And we then had a meeting because I alerted Lime as we were filming series three and we had a meeting with Lyme and the execs or one exec and Lyme were, I think at that point wanted to get the show finished. And we were about a week away from getting series three and they sort of did a little bit of 
I suppose, putting an elastoplast over, you know, a broken leg and wanted to get it finished. And we finished it and I went away and was thinking, do I want to do another series? Uh, this is at the end of series three, because I just thought it's, I'm not really now enjoying it. I really enjoyed series three because of the characters we had on. And we had, you know, that was when we had Callum, um, who was great. And we had Sam Thompson, who was great. And Seb and Talia. I know that was series four. That was series three was, set, was, 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 was Callum and Frankie Cozy and Sarah Jane Crawford, who I've known for years from a BBC days. But I just didn't, I was getting to the point where I actually didn't enjoy being, filming with, with, with particularly with Nadia and because of the setup of the show we were both dating agents sat on a sofa or a desk within two or three foot of each other just didn't become it became quite unenjoyable and we made the I kind of made the decision that I was thinking about whether I could do series four again and then Lime Pictures invited us in for a meeting separately uh, to talk about our issues and I mentioned all of mine I kind of said you know all the things I've mentioned and other stuff which which is which is kind of uh, which I won't bring into into the kind of the forum now and Lime said hello you listen we're going to deal with this you know we understand they didn't question anything I'd brought they didn't counter anything they kind of accepted it as as, as how it was and I've just realized I'm jumping between stories, but um, I left that meeting thinking, okay, well, that should be dealt with. Nadia was invited into Lyme three days later. And unbeknownst to me for some time, Jack, Nadia made an accusation to Lyme pitches that I had um, forced myself on a female celebrity on a on a social evening that we've been out and that this particular female had had to quote physically remove me from her flat they were two the uh, two allegations that Nadia made fairly clear um, accusations fairly clear sexual predator allegations there I mean I, there's no room for wiggle on that and Lime investigated the allegations and from what I've later learned they spoke to the female celebrity and a bunch of other people involved in the show just to get a feeling of you know what's he feeling about Eden and I later read that the report back was that every single person they spoke to robustly defended me and said they had no issue with me at all. And the, the, the female celebrity that I that Nadia made these accusations that I, I, you know, essentially tried to force myself on, had denied them. And they invited Nadia back three days later and told her they've been done an investigation and they've spoken to celebrity and they've spoken to a whole load of other people and everyone vehement denies any such allegations and robustly defends me. And Nadia turned round to the same four executive producers that she'd made the allegations about two, three days before and denied making the allegations. Which is a difficult one to attempt unless you are extremely deluded or very calculated. So line pictures at some point decided not to tell me and allowed me to film another series with Nadia from November to November 2017 to February 2018 without knowing that the person that I sit next to for about 300 hours of filming had tried to label me as a sexual predator. So you you didn't know at, at this point no. that she had made these allegations and that had gone through the process of an investigation through the other celebrities and all the rest of it. And you were sitting next to her and her knowing that, but you didn't. And at least 10 other people at Line Pictures knew. Wow. I didn't find out for another 
just short of six months after I'd left the show. No, how- sorry, another six months, a month before I left the show. And how did you find out? Um, I found out because a article appeared in the Daily Mail branding me um, a sexual predator uh, using uh, suggestions that I'm similar to Harvey Weinstein using the Me Too hashtag. Um, And it came from a source of the show. And within those allegations, one of them was, was that I had had a relationship with a female celebrity. And it was the same female celebrity that the allegations had been made about. Now, I didn't know about the allegations. So I saw this article. I had my suspicions who the source was, and so did Lion Pictures. And I called up the celebrity and I said, listen, there's this um, article that's appeared in the mail uh, saying that we had a relationship. Obviously, it's not true. Um, You are in L.A., uh, seven or eight hours difference. Would you mind just giving me a line so I can use it in case the papers need a line and I can't get all of you? And she replied with a voice note message telling me everything that had gone on the fact that she had been called with her manager with these allegations and she had told them lying in the October that it was completely untrue. And this was Nadia's way of trying to get me fired. And that even that Nadia had texted the celebrity after leaving Lime and making the allegations to say that she'll, that the celebrity will probably get a phone call from Lime and she needs to tell them what Nadia has essentially told them basically asked this celebrity to lie on her behavior, try and get me fired. I then found out about this and that was, that was the end of February. I had already spent a week being trolled by about six uh, fake trolling accounts on Twitter that I had done a little bit of intel on and worked out simply that all of those accounts were set up and run by Nadia Essex. And it was at that point I was like, I'm off. And I'll just say now, Jack, that I actually handed my notice in to Lime just before filming Series 4 because of, because I couldn't deal with, quote, Nadia's lying and her ability to tell the truth. And that was not accepted. So I would have left without a shadow of a doubt if they said to me, well, I'll tell you what happened. They just sat down to me and goes, right, Eden, we need to be transparent and honest with you. Nadi's brought an allegation that you're a sexual predator. We have inv- we've investigated that and it's, it's proven to be untrue. My first word question would have been great. So who's my new co-presenter? Figuring that, well, there is no place for somebody like that on a show that is about bringing love and relationships and fun. And if they'd have said to me, well, no, actually, you know, you know, Eden, you know, it's a hit, it's a hit show, you and Nadia together, it works on screen. I would have simply said, well, you can go your show, I'm off. Because this is not worth my peace of mind or my good name or the press articles that are coming out. Where was the loyalty for you because it was clear that there was some sort of preferential, you know, option to, to look after Nadia over, over yourself. So, you know, what, what's your opinion on that? I think it's twofold. I think that I think the preference, and this is my opinion, mm-hmm. I think the preference from Lion Pictures was entirely towards Celeb Go Dating. We had just, um, on Series 4, had just delivered the highest audience figures to date. They've never beaten them. And they were very much, the show must go on. And it's the hashtag I've used on my social media with all of my recent announcements. Um, Somebody made an interesting point to me last year when all this was going on and made the point that were they protecting Celebs Go Dating or were they also protecting Nadia? And if they were protecting Nadia, why were they protecting Nadia? And they made the point that Lion Pictures is a very female biased production company it's two directors a female they're both in a relationship with each other but they're also directors most of the heads of the departments are female 
and there could be and this isn't my analogy but someone that spoke to me there could be it's just that they do protect females above males i don't fully hold that or i do although i do see the logic i think it's clear to anyone that line pitches were more concerned about getting the show made and a fifth series commissioned and a six and not breaking a great show and a great relationship channel four at the expense of one of the co-hosts being labeled a sexual predator by their other co-host but being not being informed and being allowed to or being blindly led to film a series uh, for a, a, another series of uh, of slip dating surely they would have known they were playing with fire the fact that you guys were in such t- tight-knit community filming 300 hours together per series plus all the social aspects of it and all the other celebrities who have all got their own media and pr agencies looking after them in what you know the papers on a hit show will be all over this and looking for anything they can get out of it which is what they you know they end up doing but surely they knew that this would come to the surface at some point and if they were in the middle of a series they were going to have an absolute shit show to deal with yeah, I mean, the point of the, the fact of the matter is, I have now seen emails from Lion Pictures up until the point they talked to the celebrity. I haven't been given the, the, the emails after they spoke to the celebrity, which I think is telling, but they're coming, trust me. Um, there are at least eight people, eight Lime employees copied on those emails. Now, if we take those eight people, I also know Tom was aware because Nadia tried to suggest that the celebrity had confided in Tom that what Nadia was saying was true. He denied it, denied it even being in the room when Nadia said this had happened. So if we take the eight people on the email, we take Tom and we take Nadia, that's 10 people that I know about are aware of it. I didn't. The very person, the very person in the middle of this shitstorm was not made aware. Now, what does that, what kind of power do you think that gives Nadia that she can bring that allegation and still be employed? Well, it's fueling her ego, first of all, and it's also fueling the desperation of fame that she so desperately wanted at the very beginning of the series when it was first started. It sort of proves that she's above it all. Well, she thought Yeah, she- well, it also, you know, I made the point to Lyme once that, that when I found out, you know, this is then during the the you know the employment tribunal that Nadia brought after I'd proven to be a troll I mean that's another story but um I made the point to line that why wasn't Nadia um held responsible and they kind of said well she bought it in a in a confidential manner and I said okay I said now I'll give you two examples if that was proven to be true the allegation was proven to be true I'd be fired, and rightly so, absolutely rightly so. So Nadia would have got what she wanted. Nadia brings it confidentially. It's proven not to be true. She's not fired. So either way, she's got nothing to lose. She brings it and it's true, I'm fired. She stays. If it brings it not to be true, I'm not fired, but she still stays. She has zero risk. And this is an individual that I, I described to Lyme some time after this, without knowing, as I called her, um, I said to the head of press, a girl called Rachel Hardy, that I thought that Nadia was calculated. And Rachel Hardy, this was a month after these allegations had made, had made Jack, but I didn't know, but Rachel did. And her reaction was, I don't think Nadia is calculated, just stupid. Quote. And I think when we know everything about Nadia, I think I was bang on with being a suggest- my suggestion that she's calculated. If she's stupid, that's Rachel's decision, but absolutely. So taking it to where we are now with everything that's come out into the public and through the, the courts and through the, you know, the lawyers and through the line back and forth, the line pictures and everyone else that's involved. What has what has Nadia been left with in terms of a reputation for this? Has she been ousted as the person who is completely and utterly wrong for what she did and also apologize for what's happened to you and your whole journey through this ordeal? 
Right, there's two parts there. Nadia, the point we haven't touched upon, which is probably the most important of this, is that when I, but just before I left the show, um, as I said earlier, there were there were about six Twitter accounts that were absolutely gunning at me, all very much the same content, all very much the same kind of aggressive stance, pretty much set up on the same time. But just Fast sorry, just forward. to pause you in mm. on on that, what what was it about? Was it was it just this particular incident, or was it just an abrasment of different things? It was a whole bunch of things. I mean, it was kind of like you know, the, 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 the these accounts were saying that I should be. Uh, you know, Nadia is the star. Um, she should have the show for herself. Um, I bring nothing. I'm shit. Um, you know, I shouldn't, I don't deserve to be on there. La la la. Um, and it was quite very toxic and very brutal. It wasn't the kind of thing that most trolls in inverted commas really go at. This had, this, this, this had a, this had a, an MO or they had an MO. Um, and I've told this story a million times. I can do it super quickly. I was made aware that if you lose your uh, password on Twitter, you simply just put your account details in, like so at Eden Blackman, and it will show you a partial email or mobile phone uh, number that's registered to that account. And someone made the point that, why don't you do that for all of these accounts? And I did them for all of these accounts, for six of them. And all of them, every single one of them had one mobile phone registered to the account. And that account number, that phone number ended in 05, which is the last two digits of Nadia's mobile number. So I knew at that point, Nadia is working against me at press and social media, which is something I'd alerted to Lime six months before, but they seem to have not taken any accountability or uh, understanding of. Um, I then left a month later, it was six weeks between these accounts popping up and me leaving. Um, this female celebrity had given me the information five weeks before I left. And it is pretty fucking clear that there was no way I was going to be sitting on a sofa with Nadia Essex because I need to get this investigation sorted with Twitter. And a long story short, I, Twitter are very difficult to get hold of. They're also incredibly hard to get the information out of. Um, I ended up having to bring a, a court order called a Norwich Pharmacal, which is a data release order. And I ended up having to take Twitter to court, which sounds quite exciting, but it was absolutely necessary. And my last, it's the last thing I had to do. It's the only thing I could do. And the court, court papers came through and it read Eden Blackman versus Twitter. And when you see that in a court paper, you're like, my God, A, how has it come to this? And B, I'm going to court against one of the biggest data companies in the world. Um, and the judge um, uh, ran in my favor. He awarded the case to me and, and, they, and Twitter gave us tons of data on all the accounts. And the most important thing was they were registered to an, uh, a, this file, this full phone, this full phone number, and this network. And it was Nadi's network, and it was Nadi's mobile number. Um, that was over a period of eight months when these accounts were just trolling me. And I say this a lot: they were not just trolling me, Jack. They were trolling, and not limited to, but trolling a, a, a mother, a parents a single mother with diagnosed mental health issues and a child. Now that says to me that this isn't an individual just doesn't like me. This is how you can possibly, one of the accounts first 42 tweets was against a former friend of hers who is diagnosed with mental health. And I have full approval to be able to use that term. This is an individual that is incredibly, I'm talking about Nadia here, very damaged, very angry, very toxic and very dangerous. Hence why I had to take the, the Twitter action. And she was, to answer your first question, was unmasked as the troll, lost her job and celebs go dating. Um, but then to try and save kind of some sort of face, brought an employment tribunal against myself and Lion Pitches. 
um, my case was thrown out 10 months later. Um, and I then hoped that she would kind of leave me alone. I kind of hoped that she would leave me alone, but she didn't. And she continued to say all sorts of things about me and it got progressively worse. I mean, I've got text messages from people that they sent, that Nadia sent them unsolicited. I've got recordings of phone calls that Nadia's had with people where she, where she calls me the worst thing a man could be called for crimes against a female and a child. Her motivation around this, it, it, I, I'm trying to rack my brains to think of why she even would you know she's somebody who clearly has got a presence you know she's able to be fool enough people to convince them to put her on a tv show to mm -hmm. host people finding love and finding you know relationships and 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 you know prime time television but yet she's got this side of her that that is clearly not right and yet the the feeling that I've I've got sort of after hearing everything you said is that she she's got some demons that she is is clearly taking out on the likes of you and these other people that she was trolling. But what mm. what do you think after everything's happened now? What was what was her motivation? What was her reasons behind even starting this whole saga in the first place? Well, I think her motivation against me, and I've had this said to me that you know another female celebrity and another um, contributor who who became good friends on the show, um, they let me know after the trolling accounts were masked that they had sat with Nadia, and Nadia had shown them all of this hatred to me on social media, particularly Twitter, about how much people hated me and how much she was the star, and she said, "I'm going to get him fired. I'm the star. I can do the show my own." Um, sometime later after the accounts were made public, um, those two people, the celebrity and the contributor came back to me independently and went, Eden, we just want to tell you, this is what happened. She showed us these accounts and we've just realized by the name of the accounts, that the accounts that she was showing us saying how much hate, the, hatred there was for you were the accounts that were, were being run by her. So her intention was to get the show for herself. Now, and I'll pause it there because I think it's a really interesting point. If Nadia wanted me off the show, and let's face it, she's done a damn good job of trying to get me off there. Painting me as a sexual predator is unforgivable. Um, she then sets up a bunch of trolling accounts to try and get me, you know, to try and spread these unholy allegations about me. I then six weeks later, leave the show. Now, at that point, if we look at it, I've left. Nadia has got what she wanted. She might not have had the, you know, it wasn't been the master plan that she put together in her, in her dark mind, but I had left the show. Now you'd think that would have been enough, right? You'd think, well, I've got it. I've got him off the show. I can sit back and I can be you know, the star that I want to be. No, that wasn't enough for Nadia. Nadia continues then to set up eight, uh, six touring accounts to run for eight months. I've left the show, Jack. I've left the show. And I do shows, I did, you know, I, I was invited on um, Loose Women, um, in, you know, just after I left the show and I did a thing, in, nothing to do with celebs, nothing to do with Nadia, it was about, dating for the over 50s and I'm 53 I think I was 51 at the time and they did a really funny sketch where they had Brian Connolly on there who'd always fancied Linda Nolan who's one of the loose women and they got them together and it descended into pandemonium but it was great fun but I did the show talking about how it you know how dating can work Nadia trolls the show and Brian Connolly and the loose women saying how disgusting it was that I was on the show I've left the show I've left celebs why is, if you got what you wanted, me leaving the show, why continue? She, she found herself in a position where she almost got carried away 
what it sounds like carried away with the fact that she had this initial power trip of being able to bring something to the table with line pitches and this allegation and it, and it didn't it didn't you know come to fruition and, and didn't didn't happen and so therefore she's had to backtrack a bit but yet there was no repercussions on her side for essentially bringing forward a lie so then she's come forward again and even though you've left the show she can't get enough of that that sort of i don't know how to put it it's that feeling of wanting to still be involved and so how is this how is this affecting you as a as a human being and your your mental health and and your and your your ability to be able to just sort of put what was a chapter of your life with celebrities go dating behind you and move on to mm. other things well <clears throat> like i said when i left celebs i figured that was it you know i'd kind of done four series i'd left on a high in terms of audience figures I'd met on that series some great people like Talia and Seb and, you know, and Sam. We had, a, you know, really good people, people that I'm still in contact with today. But I figured that was it. And I thought I'm going to sit back and see where I want to take it or whether my experiences as celebs go dating were TV as a whole or just a really shit timing with a shit company <laughs> on a shit show. you know. <laughs> um, and for eight months, seven or eight months, I was getting relentless Twitter abuse, articles being written about me that I have now known Nadia was the source of. And, you know, it got really dark, I'm not gonna lie, from kind of, you know, beginning of January 2018 to probably about a month ago. Um, things have got very, very dark. And I'm able to talk about it now with a sense of kind of understanding and with no shame, but I would turn my phone on in the morning and I've had, I would be nauseous and anxious as to what was going to be on my Twitter timeline or being written about in the paper or what would Nadia would have put on her Instagram stories that I would be sent because I've got, the lovely thing about doing celebs is that you you build followers on social media because you're on TV. And those people, when they then find out what's gone been going on, take a side and they'll either support Nadia um, with Nadia's questionable account of what's gone on or or my side of the story, which which was, you know, proven. And I get a lot of lovely people that will go, oh my God, Eden, you need to see this. And I would get, if, if I didn't see the stuff myself, I would get it from other people. So I had no really, I had no really escape. And I can't, it's difficult to sort of say to someone who's trying to do the best they can for you, I don't want to see this. Cause it sounds really awful. It sounds like you're, you're venting at them. And I wrote so many times, how can I put to someone, thank you so much, but you know what, this isn't helping me. This is not happening. And I couldn't say what was going on because of the court case and anything I said, you know, listen, you know, I've been trolled by fake accounts. I have no idea if any of these people are, you know, unless I've met someone, then I know who they are on, on Twitter or, or, or Instagram, like your good self. But so I had to sort of see this, even if I didn't want to. And the effects it had on me was that I was, I was having to have conversations with my parents about articles and online suggestions that are being made about me that are entirely, not only untrue, but not the kind of thing that you want as a only child to have to have with your parents. Mum and dad, there's an allegation coming over tomorrow in the mail that I'm a sexual predator. Nobody wants that, no one. And it got to the stage where I started questioning, is really life worth carrying on with? Because when it's a day, it's a day, a day, a day, it's like Groundhog Day. It's like every day you're like, what's next? What's next? And it gets worse. You know, I mentioned earlier about the people that had sent me text messages that Nadia had sent her and the phone calls people had recorded with her. Well, it's beautiful of them to do that and really lovely that they were looking out for me. It also says that they didn't believe a single bloody word of what she was saying to bring those allegations to me. Because if they had any thought, hey, you know what, that, you know, I could see even being that person, they wouldn't bring it. They'd just go, I don't want a piece of this. 
So I take huge solace and, and support that people went, well, you need to see these. And you know what? You need to do something about this. But it, it, it has its effect on you. And particularly when you're then in a 10 month court case for an employment tribunal from the woman that you've just proven was running trolling accounts is you've got to think, how did this happen and why me? And I don't want to be that kind of guy that cries or, you know, why me, why me? But you do go, hang on. I got a phone call in May 2016 about a fun, entertaining youth market TV show about finding love and fun and relationships. How the fuck did this come? And there were lots of times that I, I really seriously considered taking my own life. And there were, there were a number of examples I remember. I remember, and I've said this in the press, you know, I'm not in any way a particularly religious person in the sense that if I escape getting a parking ticket, I'll look up to the sky and go, thank you. You know, that's about as far as I believe in a higher spirit, a, a higher power. I believe there's something, but don't ask me what it looks like or what its name is. I don't know. It could be Jesus, Buddha or Bart Simpson. I, you know, it's just there as an entity. But I went to bed on four months, not every night, but most nights. And I kneeled by my bed and I physically prayed. I physically prayed that I wouldn't wake up the next morning because I didn't want another day of it. And it got to a point where um, the people around me were worried. Um, I had all of the... I suffer quite badly from my, migraines. I have done for about six years. It's a family thing. My, my mum gets them. My granddad got them. You know, it's just one of them things. And I always have migraine tablets in the house. I always had headache tablets in the house. It got to the stage where the people around me took every pill from the house because they were concerned about where I was. And that was a fact that I brought to Sarah Tykiff, who's the head of non-scripted TV at Line Pictures. I actually said that to her. And it was met with a sort of, oh, sorry to hear that, Eden. No support, no, not at that point, not even a transparency of what's gone on. And there were a few times where I sat myself down and the last time I did it, I was at White City House. I just used the gym. And I figured that that's it. It's the last time I'm going to use the gym because I'm not going to be here tomorrow. And I walked upstairs and I sat on these communal seats that they've got just outside the, the old BBC studios. And I sat myself down and I talked to myself in my head for about 20 minutes. And I gave myself approval to end my life that night. Because... I just didn't want it anymore. I just didn't want to be in this body and in this mind. I wanted to be free and whatever it took, whether it was after this life, it is just black and darkness and nothing. Like, give it to me. My favorite part of the day was when I was asleep at night because I had peace. And I thought, well, let's have permanent peace. And I remember sitting down and, and having that conversation and being really calm about it, very peaceful about it, Tom. I, uh, Tom, sorry, Jack. I was really, you know, super like, ah, oh, that decision's been made, a weight lifted. I was going to end my life. A weight lifted, it doesn't, but on my head, it was like, this has got, that's got to be better than what I'm going through on a day-to-day -day basis here. And I can't remember who it was, but someone called me up that night, just about nothing. You know, they'd heard a record on the radio and thought about me or one of my favourite bands or, you know, there was a pair of trainers just been released, Eden. If, you, you know, if you're aware, you know, the kind of stuff that I'm into, or I've just got a new t t tattoo or here's a picture of a cat, you know. And they saved my life. You know, they just spoke to me and they didn't know that that night I was, I was going to take a bunch of pills. I was going to drink a lot of Jack Daniels and I was not going to wake up next morning. And to put that on the people around me, is, is, I wouldn't say it's unforgivable because it is forgivable because I don't, I don't, I'm not ashamed of where I was and I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to 
pretend I'm, 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 that, that, I, that, that something happened that I'm appalled at. I'm appalled that it was allowed to get to that stage for me, but I'm fucking glad I didn't do it. And <sighs> it's little things right now that, that really make the difference. Um, and it sounds crazy, but <laughs> I'm a big Leeds United fan. I've been a Leeds United fan for like 40 odd years. And we've been through the best of times, you know, you know, in year 2000, which sounds so long ago now, you know, I was flying to Barcelona and Rome and Milan to see him play in the Champions League. You know, it's just, just, and then three and a half years later, I'd get off a train on a Tuesday night to see us play our first game in the first division against Gillingham. You know, this is, what you know, the, where, did, <laughs> where did that go? And we've just had, a really t really odd couple of two years. We've got a brand new manager called Bia Marcella Bielsa, who I call God. I love the man. I love the man. And we were close to getting in the Premiership last year, our last year after six, after sixteen years away. This was 28, 29, 2018, 2019. And if I'd have taken my life um, in the period that I was seriously considering it. I wouldn't have seen us, <laughs> this sounds crazy, but I wouldn't have had the beautiful, joyous 16 year release of seeing that happen on the, on the 17th of July this year and seeing it in my front room. And uh, unfortunately I wasn't at the game. I wasn't with friends because of COVID, damn you COVID. But just having those moments and it's those moments that I'm really, really, I hold on to dearly because I know had I have been a little bit more determined and a little bit more wrongly focused, I wouldn't have been here. We wouldn't have had these conversations. And it's those kind of times where you just thank the Lord that you maybe were, a, you didn't have the balls to do it. Um, and I don't mean that in a kind of manly alpha male strength sense, I just mean I didn't have the balls to do it on the, on the, on the times that it was seemed the only way out. And a, a really good friend of mine gave me a beautiful a line and said something like, I hope I don't get this wrong, but said something like suicide is a permanent um, resolution to a temporary issue. And I've like, whoa, you know, if I was still getting tattoos, which I don't because I'm too old now, that would be front and centre because it was, it was so true. It was, it was, you know, it's so true. It's permanent to something that will, will hopefully, with the goodest, with the, you know, best will in the world will pass. And this has passed. I am now done. Nadia Essex is no longer my problem. It's taken a long time but I don't have to worry about what people say to me in the, in the papers. Part of the harassment order that I had to bring against Nadia after all of this bullshit was that uh, we believe that she was the, the source or the contributor to a number of um, newspaper articles. And part of the agreement was that she would contact the journalists and the papers to have those articles removed. And she did that without challenge. And I had half a dozen articles removed from the Daily Mail, had articles removed from the Sun, the Star, uh, Metro and the Mirror. And if you've ever tried to get an article removed from one paper, you will understand how difficult it is. To get about 16 is a huge achievement. The fact that they were there still haunts me and it still bugs me. But the fact that they have been removed, I think, says everything about the legitimacy of those articles and also the likelihood of who's who put them there. And I mentioned it earlier, the article that popped up about the, in the mail about, you know, the, using the Harvey Weinstein um, suggestions, that was one of them. I've got a couple of things I wanted to touch on after, after you sharing that, Eden. First of all, thank you for being so honest and open and vulnerable about your your accounts. It's um, it's it's incredible to hear such 
a huge part of your life be so awful but also so insightful in in other ways you know you, you come through something that not many people would would ever experience their life and, and have come through and realized things that you know are that the, the way the fact that you didn't take your own life is 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 is, is, a, is incredible but it's it's also what you've learned from that and how you've taken mm. the little things and moved forward with them what support did you have from line pitchers the people on, on 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 your side of this of this fiasco of people that have dealt with the show and that knew about what was going on what support did you have that you could have relied on to help with that time of your life what really good question um from line pictures i have had no support at all um they appear to have done very little regarding a number of situations that happened to me was on the show that we talked about. Um, in my opinion, they've done nothing to, to protect me from my employment, my dealings with Nardi Essex. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think myself and Nadia would have mentioned, would have met socially. Um, we didn't, we don't go to the same things, you know, the kind of places I go aren't the places that interest her and vice versa. And it, that's, you know, that's life. So I don't think there would have been any, opportunity that would become friends or, 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 or socialized. So from my experience, my involvement with Nadia begins and ends with line pitches. And they've not apologized to me or never reflected any remorse or disapproval for their actions. And that includes not being transparent about some fairly awful and life ending and career ending allegations that were brought to them and proved to be lies. So that's Lyme. Um, Lyme, I think, to, to me, has shown in a, a non-existent duty of care. Um, and I think that is because, like I said, in my opinion, they were more concerned on the ratings than being transparent um and that's from my experience but that's stuff that's been backed up you know there was a brilliant show a couple of weeks ago on bbc about that Ovi did from love island about uh duty care um and he touched upon mike obviously mike thalassitis that um that was on series four uh and sadly soon after took his life um but interestingly line were the only company that were spoken to because there were two individuals, one that was person that was on TOWIE and one that was on Geordie Shaw, both of which are Lion Pitches Productions, um, who had the same situation as me. One of them took the life, a male tried to take, was considered taking his life. Um, and they were the only company that were given statements at the end, uh, which I thought was quite telling um, in the world of reality TV. Um, in terms of others, a number of people involved in the show came out and gave me information um, and part and information that I would have never have discovered had they have given it. And I, you know, I, again, I can't thank them enough for, for being that completely honest with me and that upfront and going, you know, I didn't tell you this. One of them actually said, I didn't tell you this at the time, because I know that if you'd have found out you'd have left the show and I didn't think you should leave the show because of this. My, it's an odd one in terms of talking about the people around me because, because of what happened with Nadia and her trolling accounts. This is like, as I said, and I won't labor the point, but this is a person that I filmed one of the most successful dating show, TV shows that have been. It's, you know, the apple of Channel 4's eyes. Um, but yet one person from that show decides that she has such issues that she needs to set up half a dozen trolling accounts. I then started to really question who I actually could trust. And I mean that in a sense that I, I was very insular because I didn't know what was being fed back. You know, it was a, it was an odd one. It, it's, and I didn't, it's part of the reason I didn't talk to my doctor about the, um, about how I was feeling about my, my suicidal kind of thoughts. And I, I say this in true sense, my doctors is just at the end of the road. I could stand up and see my doctors and they've got a pharmacy there. 
and I go and get my my migraine tablets from them. And the girl, every time I go in there, unbeknown to me, it was pointed out by somebody that came on me, she knows you from the show. And she so wants to talk about the show, but she's sort of like a little, you know, I, I use the word starstruck. I'm not a star, but I understand, you know, I'd say that about if I saw somebody in the, in the street that I saw from TV. Um, and she started talking to me about it one day, you know, oh my God, I love celebs. And I'd left by that point, I think. And I was even thinking, Christ, I can't even go to my doctors without someone, if they, if they heard or saw my records, would that be given on social media? Would that be put in the press? You know, you really start to get really concerned about it. So I cut, you know, sadly cut a lot of people from my inner, inner circle simply because I was, I was protecting myself. I simply didn't know where this information or, or what I, if I'd said something to someone, where it would end up because I've been trolled by a person that I did a bloody TV show. It was meant to be on screen, you know, best mates. And that was the incredible part, you know, that when it came out, so many people said you would never, I had no idea from the show that all this was going on. Um, but I have got some life saving people around me. Um, and there was one particular person who has uh, been a mate of mine for 20 odd years. He's, um, He's involved with Calm and uh, the Black Dog um, Men's um, health, Mental Health Charities. And he's a patron and ambassador for either both or, or both. And I trust him. Um, you know, I trust him with my last, you know, my, my last thought. And I would speak to him a couple of times a week um, and just either break down or go, I'm having a moment. Or he would just have the knowledge like a sixth sense to phone me at that moment where I'm looking, I can't do this anymore. Um, my mum and dad were amazing. Um, I've had some really challenging conversations. I've had to have some really conversations with them for what's been going on because it was beginning to get on top of me and I had to be honest with them. Um, and just, you know, like I say, you know, half a dozen people around me, maybe tops that I could just talk to and just hearing. And when we, when, my, when, when Nadia was outed as the troll, just the social media reactions to me, just my, you know, messages and DMs and emails and of just people that I'd never met just going, we always, you know, I hope you're okay. Or we always knew there was something dodgy about her or you always seem like a nice guy or that was really lovely. And when, when I announced the harassment order that I, you know, I had to get over Nadia and, and finally free myself of, of her and her lies, my DMs went crazy. I mean, it, in the sense that, you know, just people that I don't know, just going, I'm so glad even that you're free of this, you know, this must have been awful. Um, and from people that I've never met, and, from, and actually now from celebrities that I've never met, I got the, I won't say who it was, but I got the loveliest one from someone that you would know just reaching out going Eden I, I've been watching this I hope you're okay and you're like boy you know that just for people to take the time just to send you a couple of lines and go I hope you're okay glad this is all behind you what's your next plans are you going to be on the tv I'm like at the moment I'm just going to sit down on my sofa and look at the rest of you know that close this chapter and look at the next chapter which looks a whole more more sunnier and rosier and brighter than the last one um yeah on a broader scale someone who's been through this what is your opinion on the current laws around internet trolling and fake accounts twitter do nothing about them twitter do zero they do not care and they will tell you they do but how and i'll say this how nadia is still permitted to have a Twitter account, beggar's belief. I remember someone saying that they think that every Twitter account should be linked to a bank card. And I think that makes complete sense. How so? Where you can, where you can, ha you physically have to prove who you are behind each account. Hmm. There has to be some sort of, and I'm fortunate and I'm very proud to have a verified account on, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, everyone 
I can set up an account in three minutes and start trolling anyone. I could start trolling you, start trolling Celebs Go Dating, anyone I wanted, saying anything I wanted about anything. And the fact that there's a platform that allows people just simply to do that with no verification or no proof, all you need to do with Twitter is either have, you know, a burner mobile phone, which without putting ideas into her head, had no idea done that in the first place, instead of rather stupidly using her own mobile phone, things would have been completely different. She'd have probably still been on Celebco dating. Or a fake email address. Now, I don't know anyone in the world who hasn't got a fake email address. I mean that in the sense that I've got them for winning trainer raffles <laughs> because, you know, because you get as many as you, many applications as you can for it or whatever. If it's, you know, trying to get Glastonbury tickets or it's trying to, you have, everyone has one. The very fact that oh, that's all you need to be able to spend eight months of your life making unholy allegations about an individual that you that, you know, is is appalling and i think the problem that twitter have is that they don't want to recognize the amount of fake and trolling accounts they have because it will affect share price and they also don't care they would care if it was a member of their family they would care if they're their son or their daughter or their brother or their husband who was having the kind of appalling accusations said about them as I had been. And I, I don't think I'm anything special. I, I, I know that there are people out there that have way, way worse things said about them. But Twitter do not care about trolling accounts because it would be very, very simple for them to do that. The problem is that they would lose, I reckon they'd lose at least, I, I'd say 25 to 35% of their account database would be wiped off. I truly do. Mm, I agree. And what would that say then about your company? You've got a value. You've got a share index. Suddenly you lose a third of your, or, you know, 25% of a third of your membership because they're all fake. But that's not going to, that's not going to do well, very well with NASDAQ. It's not going to do a jet, do well with Joe, da Joe, you know, with the kind of the, the with the halls, it's not going to do well with your share uh, shareholders. It's a simple case that they don't care because if they could do it, if I can get the information about Nadia by simply having to go to court, I say simply, but it's a relatively simple process. Mm. Once you know what you've got to do, they have a huge amount of data and they could easily wipe off all of them. And there has to be some sort of steps in, in, in process to validate that who you are. Mm. How much, if you're happy sharing, have you spent? Yeah, of course legal fees and not just emotionally but in terms of physical you know money time and effort on on getting this put to bed um time and effort i can honestly say that since february 2018 till today because we're talking about it today there has not been a day where i haven't had to deal with something regarding nadia or and line pictures close, close to three years and yeah. time um sorry money spent on the various tribunals you've been to and the court fees yeah. and the lawyers and everything what's what's that figure i can give you the exact figures jack um for me to go to twitter and win that case cost me eight grand plus that which at that point i thought was i'll, I'll pay that because a, I will then go back to Nadia and say, you need to pay this as part of a, a, a deal, which is what we did, and she ignored it. Um, and we told her that we would go for her an harassment order if she didn't agree, and she didn't. So that's why the harassment order came some point. Um, I have subsequently, including that eight grand, spent over a hundred thousand pounds on lawyers' fees. And the majority of that has been fighting the employment tribunal that Nadia bought for harassment against me, having been proven that she was harassing me as an internet troll. The problem with, the problem with uh, employment tribunals are, is that there is no, um, 
set up that if you lose that you're liable for the other party's costs so i talk about nadia having a win-win situation if she won it she'd have come out of it looking look what look what he did to me she didn't win it she doesn't have to pay anything anyway so moving i'm looking at this from a a point of view of people who have had this experience happen to them as well as you you know it, it, it's it, um, you know you're in a fortunate position that you have the finances to be able to do that at, so, you know and be able to push this but what well, is- i had t- you know jack just said i had i i didn't have the finances i had to work i had to work a way of of, of, of raising that money okay and at the age of 52 you do not want to be looking how am i going to raise you know 80 mm. grand to fight a bullshit employment tribunal against someone who should have, with respect, been fired from the show six months before you even left. I think no, I think Lime are accountable for those legal costs. Okay. Um, but sorry. And no, the question was around people who have had, if people listening to this have maybe experienced something of a similar nature, but have zero idea about how to go about it. Maybe they've been trolled for, for years or maybe five minutes, but they, they, they don't know what to do next. What advice would you give to somebody who has listened to this story and thought, holy shit, that's happened to me or is happening to a friend of mine or is going through going through exactly the same thing right now? What is their first point of call? I would have, I advise them to think very carefully, which is a line that my lawyer says to me all the time. And now I can't believe I'm saying to somebody else, and I apologize, but I would advise them to think very carefully about how much this is gonna, it's gonna cost them if they want to see it all the way through to what I have done. Most internet trolls, and social media trolls are a little bit smarter than Nadia and don't use their own registered mobile phone number to set up the accounts. I was in some way, I suppose you could say fortunate on that level that I was able to prove it without any doubt that it was her. I get a lot of people asking me that question, obviously, um, from being a high profile, I suppose, news story that what went on about two people on a dating show. Um, it is very difficult to try and get any um, end, any kind of um, justice if an individual has bought a burner phone from the 7-Eleven or is setting up an account on Gmail and is not doing and has a VPN on their on their on their phone or their laptop, so you can't see the country where it was. What caught Nadia was was that the the, the the information that we got from Twitter included every single login across the accounts and every single IP address. And when I hand that information over to Lime, Lime went through it and um, she lied to them for seven weeks saying she had an involvement, even though Twitter had sent her a letter saying, we're giving all this information to Eden Blackman. We had sent her a lawyer's letter saying, we know it's you, Twitter have told it's you, we know Twitter have told it's you, can you just stop? Can you pay my legal costs? And can you make an apology? That's when the um, employment tribunal came on because she's incapable of admitting, you know, uh, guilt or, 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 or culpability. She's lied to, Lion Pictures saw the information that I gave them. She lied to them for seven weeks. She even signed a legal letter with all of the accounts listed and they asked her to sign next to each one, whether that she had no involvement or in, 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 interest in it. And they gave her a day to think about it. And she came back and she signed it. Seven weeks later, they'd spent the whole time going through all the IP addresses. And because Nadia is a, loves a bit of a kind of attention on social media, they were able to prove that on this particular day, when this particular tweets were sent, c- calling a mother a vile bully C dot dot T, that Nadia was in Mykonos and the IP address was in Mykonos. And another one, she sent someone calling them, you know, telling them that kids should be, that social services should be called on this person's kids. These are complete strangers, Jack. That that was May, I think she sent that in. That was, the IP address was in Spain and she was in Spain. And that's the point where they came. Now, all of those IP addresses are useful, but you have to prove that that person was there at the time. We were only able to do that, or line pictures were only able to do that because she put pictures of herself going, hey, look at me in Mykonos. And when they said that IP address is that is Mykonos, where are you in Mykonos? Then seven weeks later, she went, yes, it was me. It's narcissistic. 
It's just it's yeah, mental. insane. But, but in terms of answering your original question, I appreciate, appreciate I've, I've kind of diverted there. It's a long process. It can feel that you are getting nowhere. And there are many times that I thought where that I'm not that I'm not going to get anywhere with Twitter. It took my lawyer and they were decent lawyers. It took them seven weeks to get a, just a reply from Twitter. Now, when you want when you know it's when you know is that information is true, you just want somebody to go. Yeah, it's true. And you're waiting seven weeks for them to go. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> hey, with Twitter. Everything's cool, man. You know, it's just you just it's 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 debilitating. It's exhausting. But I remember when my lawyer called me um, and she she WhatsApp me in August 2018 and said, Eden, next message, Twitter have been in touch. I'm emailing them. This is after we'd won the account, won, won the court case. And I phoned her out and said, you're not, do not email me. What was it? What did they say? And she told me that the accounts were, were Nadia's mobile and her um, registered to her, her provider, but she broke down. My lawyer actually broke down. And my lawyer has been through some big, big heavy duty cases. I mean, big cases. And even she was moved by the emotion and the final, you know, peace of mind that I'd been given that I wasn't going crazy. Um, it was a moment I'll never forget. Because uh, I thought at that point, it's going to be like, right, we'll go to Nadia. You do that. We know it's you. Can you stop? And my life is, you know, back on. Fuck, did I know what was coming? Um, there's a couple of companies you can use. There's a couple of real, I mean, you know, like I said, if someone is dumb enough to use their own mobile phone number to set up a trolling account, you can try putting that account into Twitter. But if they're smartish, they'll use, they'll use a fake email account or a fake um, mobile number to go to court against Twitter to win that information, as I say, cost me eight grand. And you've got to think, is it worth it? what do you mm -hmm. get from that? Um, it's, it's tough and you'll get no support from Twitter. You will get zero support from Twitter unless you do it legally. Eden, what have you learned after all of this? I've learned to go, I've learned that my gut is one of my strongest things that, that I was born with. My gut early on in celebs was that Nadia is, is not an individual to be trusted, not an individual to believe in and anything is possible and when i'm going to line pitches going making my complaints there was part of me thinking that they're actually going to help and i really should have gone you're not going to help me i'm off i wish i'd have left uh in the october i wish they'd have told me about her allegations and there are more but we you know time is against us here um i wish they'd have told me because i so i could have left and I would have saved, I wouldn't have been in the dark space that I've been for the last few years. Um, but my belief is if had I left, you know, I said earlier, you know, I said I'd asked who my, who my co-host is. And if that wasn't and somebody knew I would have left. I know from now when the stories were broke when she was announced, proven as the Twitter, a Twitter troll, if they would have announced in the papers why she'd have been fired, they'd have been a shit show. If I'd have left, I would have announced why I'm leaving. And I'm leaving because my co-host has, has falsely accused me of being a sexual predator. They would have then had to get rid of Nadia. I find it a bit kind of odd that this was less than a month before we started filming series four. I think it's fairly evident as to why they didn't want to tell us. Because mm -hmm. they would have found themselves trying to find one or two new dating agents in a month. When I left, I had to do this with some legal stuff the other day, which I won't go into. But I, I saw how long it took Lime to, um, to replace me with Paul, who I think is, is great. I think he's actually um, uh, oversubscribed for the job. I think he's, he's far, far better than the show needs because I think he's incredibly smart and very, very good at his job. Um, and how long they took to replace... Um, Nadia with Anna, somebody else who I've met. Um, they took at least two months to, to confirm Paul and they had to get Paul from America. And I think it was three months um, that it took with Anna. 
So that would have put their schedule, filming should have started in November. They would have put this, probably, probably put the schedule of series four at starting at the period it was meant to end, which would have meant they would have missed their window for it to be out Jan February, March, as is the whole, it's always September, it's always March. Um, I think it's fairly conclusive as to why that information wasn't given to me. So my gut, I now know my gut is like, everyone's, I think everyone has that, but there's so many times where you go, I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm not that dumb, but I'll look at something on like a pair of trainers or like a pair of like a vintage jeans that I want. I'm like, and it's cheap and I've got on eBay, I go, yeah, but you know, it might just be, and you're like, no, it's a, it's a rip off. <laughs> you know, you kind of, you know, my gut's pretty good, but I, this one, I should have been stronger and I should have gone, nah. I'm not taking you, you're lying to me or you're not telling me something. And you mentioned it earlier, which, which we didn't, which I didn't respond to. It made the really interesting point that did Lyme really not think I was going to find out? You know, at some point, someone's going to tell me. Now, isn't it better for the company to sit down and tell me than someone third party on a voice note? Or in the newspaper. Or in the newspaper, yeah. Shocking. Shocking. The integrity of everybody involved has just been shot to bits. You know, the, mm. the, the fact that there was no clear positive outcome of any of this, you know, and so the fact that Nadia started this whole saga off the back of God knows what motive, but has, has let it, let it almost just roll and roll and roll. And she could have put a stop to it at any point and so could have Lyme. And so, you know, it, and it's just, you've been dragged through the mud. Well, I said I said at the time, Jack, when we when when we got the notification from Twitter and we my, my, my lawyer sent her a letter saying, listen, we know it's you. You know, it's you. Twitter have told you that they're going to send Eid and the information. They know it's you. All we want is you to stop. That was the first thing we put on that letter. We want you to stop. We want you to pay my fees and to apologize. And the amount of people that said, if she'd have done that, she'd have done that on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it rumbled, Monday, no one cares. It's gone on to something else. And if they'd have been smart, and I'm not saying this would have happened, but my belief would have been that if she'd have been said straight to Lyme, that it was her instead of lying for seven months, I would suggest that Lyme would have gone, okay, so we've lost Eden and we've lost 44% of the audience from series four to series five. So we're in a hole and they never regained that audience. And now we're gonna to have to lose Nadia. Fuck, you know, the two, the two of the three people that you think of celebs at that point have gone. You know, it's like Top Gear without Richard and James, you know, it's, it's all, you know, or, or Jer Jer uh, Jeremy or James, you know. Um, how about, and this is just how I would have handled it if I were lying. I'm not saying they would have, but I'm just a suggestion. They could have said to Nadia, okay, we're suspending you for series five because we need to do that. We can't have you being on a series when this story breaks. Because of course they filmed series ahead. Mm. So that's coming out in September when the story is going to be breaking. So they can't have her suddenly going, morning, darlings. How are we? Isn't, what, isn't life beautiful? It's all about love. Then having been in that morning being shown as a, you know, a multiple trial. I would have suggested to Lyme, if, if, you know, if I was working, I'm gonna go, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna suspend your series five, and Nadia, I'll tell you what you're gonna do. You're gonna go off to an ashram, or you're gonna go off to a yoga retreat, or you're gonna go off to the bottom of the Himalayas or Tibet, and you're gonna find yourself for two weeks. And you're <laughs> gonna come back, and you're gonna do one interview going, oh, Daily Mail, the star, the sun. I'm so appalled at myself. I don't recognize who that person was. I clearly had some anger issues. I was clearly, you know, a different person, but I'd gone away and I've spent my time in the ashram or the foot or the, or the foot of the Himalayas and I have found myself and I am here to be a better person. Fast tracked into series six, life's good. But yet yeah, the wonderful and fantastically uh, awkward thing called ego took over and let her become the yeah. nasty well, ego, Yeah, e ego on Nadia's part and a, a, an appalling duty of care on Lyme's part. He oh. it said it's a really toxic cocktail, but I'm glad that both are uh, behind me. Mm. 
and it's clear that the awareness you know you shared some shared some pictures with me for the end credits of the shows you mentioned before Towie and and Geordie Shaw are now being well you know it's 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 doing them bare minimum in my opinion but it's it's showing that they do have some sort of psychological care for the contributors as they so say in in these in these shows so moving forward do you think Lyme has learnt their lesson oh wow that's a good question no from the people I've spoken to that have been on the show and I've had a lot of people reach out past Lyme cast members you know they you know that we've got Hollyoaks uh, we've got Towie which has been on for 23 series or 25 series just sat, you know 10 years um Geordie Shaw I've had a lot of people reach out and share their experiences of working with them I and I'll say this we sadly lost we sadly lost Mike Thalassesis um just a short time after he was on Celebs um, my last series and, and sadly the last TV he did. Um, and he was, if I could take a moment, he was a beautiful man. He got a real paste in for this muggy Mike persona. Um, but I had conversations with him and he was really worried on text, you know, how he was going to come out. Have you seen the rushes for tonight? Am I okay? And I'm like, Mike, you, it comes good in the end, you know. Um, it is a, sad that we lost Mike because I, I really like the guy. Um, slime, sorry, that was a, a Freudian slip. I didn't say slime then. Lime, um, if we believe what Nadia said about her mental health, um, Lime are fortunate that there hasn't been a couple more people that have taken their lives following being on the show, been on Slow Go Day Single Lime Pictures Productions. And I sadly think that had we had it with Caroline, who was someone I never met, but I always heard, you know, pretty good things about her. It always takes the worst thing to happen for someone to kick into action. And I think that it will take, sadly, another tragedy of an individual not being able to cope and not being given support and not being given the, the honesty and respect and you said it integrity of a company before something changes um so do i think lime have pic pictures have learned from the dealings i've had with them recently not for a minute it's a shame because the internet and the world of that we live in these days has become more virtual has become more based around the social aspect of social media watching tv netflix all that sort of stuff they have a duty of care to not just the people that are watching the show but also the people on the show and where does the line where's the line drawn between ratings and a show being you know let's be honest most people that most public that like a show like it when it's polarizing you know you take celebrities go dating when there's a great romance or a bad romance or you take love island when something goes wrong the drama people love the drama but where is the line that's drawn between drama on a show and somebody's real life and their impact it has ongoing after that incident because as you said yourself there's things that happen that are old news within a day but it sticks with people like yourself and Mike and all the other people that have been affected by social media and, and the trolling and uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the disregard of the, the production companies f forevermore. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think it depends on the, on the production company and I think it pretend, depends on the broadcaster. Um, uh, you know, a lot, I know, I'm sure a lot of people don't know, but you know, TV shows, when you watch a TV show on BBC or ITV, it's not made, on the whole, it's not made by them. It's made by a production company, so it's a third party. So it really does depend on the conversations that that production company and transparent conversations they're having with the broadcaster. Um, they don't want to risk those conversations because they have a business with them. Um, and if it's proven that they are not doing the job they, they should do and it then risks the broadcaster, then that kind of sullies that relationship uh, it's like it's you know any relationship it brings negativity and and a question into it then you're going to be wondering is it worth it um i think there are good production companies out there um and broadcasters and equally i think there are polling ones um and i think sadly that we live like you say in, a, in an age where all people care about our ratings 
um, you know, there, there were albums and there are films that were made years ago that absolutely did nothing um, on release. And then over time become, you know, what's considered masterpieces. I mean, you know, Guns N' Roses after that for Destruction barely did anything for its first year. And then suddenly they got a bite with MTV in the US and then it was huge. Then it, you know, it's one of the biggest selling albums ever, but it wasn't an instant hit. And the problem, we, the problem we have now is that we live in a world, particularly TV, where it's all about instant hits. You know, mm. the first, the most important uh, audience numbers of a series are episode one. Because people don't come to shows, particularly reality, and sort of into f show four or five or six. Like you don't start watching uh, Strictly at episode nine. You know, you need to see it all the way through. You wouldn't start watching, you know, I don't know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, an hour and a half in because there's no point, you know, what's going on. Um, but we live in a point where that is the most important one. And if, if, if things, if, if, if issues and stories are, could have a negative impact on the show, the show in my experience will be the most important thing. And sadly, that's the decision of the production company and or the producers for that to happen. Mm. And this won't be the first time that there's, there's something chaotic that happens in the world of TV. Um, but, and it sadly won't be the last time that it affects somebody's mental health. I hope it's the last time. I hope we've seen the part with, with you know, moments with Mike and, and Caroline where it takes them so bad that they can't carry, they can't carry on. But sadly, I don't think we have. I think as well that there is also gonna be a endless line of people that would queue up to be on a show such as celebrities go dating or love island or whatever it might be whether it be contestants from the from the general public or whether it's up and coming celebrities and stars that want their big break on tv that mm. you know are potentially going to turn a blind eye to the fact that this could psychologically really fuck them up for the next god knows how many years if something was to go wrong or if the wrong thing was said or the, or the media get a hold of it you know it, it's it's the sad reality is that some people are aware of the issues but maybe just pretend that they're not there until it hits them straight in the face yeah, it's, it's a kind of case of, I mean, you've got to look at Love Island particularly. I don't have any axe to grime in Love Island. I don't particularly watch it. Um, I've seen it. It's just not my thing. Mm. Um, but the people that are going in there, particularly the last couple of years, I think, are simply in there to get a profile and an Instagram account and uh, a collaboration with Boohoo or ASOS. Mm. And an invitation to this party, and, and a, you know, a, a makeup deal with this company, or you know, wh whatever it be. That's entirely what it is, and a lot of them do very, very well out of it. I mean, I, I mentioned the show that Ovi did a couple of weeks ago, and they talked to a couple of people that have been on Love Island, and they talked about you know, talked about how much they can earn a month. It's great. It's lovely. It's lovely earning money because it gives you choices to be able to do things. Does it bring you happiness? No, it doesn't. It brings you choices. Mm. And I think people do, particularly young people, and I say that you know, as a 53-year-old guy, that young people look at that and go, no, I'll be fine if I've got, you know, a million pounds in a bank and two million pe people on Instagram. It's not true. And you get no support. You know, we look at Mike. Mike, you know, was doing great guns. He was really popular. Girls absolutely adored him and you know i talk about when we did our first mixer and sam thompson sort of rolled in and was like really confident like you know because with respect i think i think the two people that got in the head weren't and i mean this in the nicest sense they weren't good looking fellas but they were interesting they had substance depending on what you go for and he was like oh i've got this and then mike walks in and he just goes <gasps> You know, you can see it's like, I've got, I've lost this. I'm second now, you know, I was first <laughs> a minute ago. Um, but he, he, on paper, he had everything he was going for. He, you know, he looked, I mean, he got, but that, that might look great. I mean, he had a great body, a great physique, dressed well, very cool persona, but inwardly was in turmoil. And I think people do put themselves in situations where they're like, it'll be okay if I've got money or mm. it'll be okay if I've got, um, adoration. It's incredible the amount of people that use Twitter, uh, sorry, Instagram as a means to feel some sort of um, validation mm. or, you know, as someone saying, oh, you look great today. It's lovely, but you don't know the, you know, you, you don't know who they are. You don't know what they're saying. You don't know what their motives is. Somebody says it in the street, 
you know, somebody would stop me and go, oh, where'd you get your trainers from? They're amazing. That, that, you know, it's a lovely thing to say. Or, or where'd you get your haircut, your tattoos or whatever? We all get it. You must get it as well. Everyone gets yeah. it. You get stopped. You go, I feel great. I've just, just because somebody said they like my trainers. That's a nice thing to say. That's the nice thing to hear. But that, that instant gratification from Instagram likes and comments is, is, is something we need to really look at because mm. it's not real. It absolutely isn't. It's yeah. just not real. I did a 450 day detox from social media a couple of years ago. Um, and it was, it was probably one of the most incredible, uh, how do I put this realizations of, 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 of my sort of adult life that you could rely so much on something that was basically just, that could be taken away from you in an instant. You know, the, the, the app itself, you don't own anything on that app. The, no. the app owns it all, just like Twitter does with all the data. You know, you have no mm. control over it. The problem is that people get sucked into this instant gratification, you know, quick like, quick dopamine hit of, I must post something today because I feel like everyone else is, so I am as well. And the biggest thing I took away from 450 days off social media was that actually people are not, that their, their minds are numb to the world you know you don't talk to people in the street that you don't know anymore you don't say hello to people you don't it, it just doesn't happen and as you said yourself that feeling of connection with people is actually a, a becoming a dying breed it's unless you know that person from before you know it, people start conversations over instagram over D dms over whatever it might be no one talks to anyone you know if you go to a bar most people will find out who's in their bar by going on a dating app or hinge or whatever they are to find out who's in my vicinity you know it's it's, it's just sad and i think that there's got to be a big shift and, I, and I, I kind of hope that the next generation coming through that are using these apps from a younger and younger age you know gen z or x or whatever we're on at the moment looking at it and going like, is this really how I want to live my life? Is this how, do I really want to be someone who knows all my friends purely through an, through an app on a phone? Or do I, mm. does it want to go full circle and be like when we were kids and actually you go out and play with someone in the park, and you meet them by kicking a football around with them, whatever it might be. Mm. So I think mm. that the, the, these, these things are awful and I think that they are, they are, they're wrong. And, and I, but I also think they are highlighting what could be the, the, the problems in, the social media instant gratification system we live in and hopefully start people will start to catch on to the fact that we, we we don't actually live on our phones we live in the human world and we live with each other in that way and that we can move to move forward together in a way that's actually that's separate to us that's not who we are we're not who our profile says we are with millions of followers we're actually just a human being with thoughts mm. feelings and respect of ourselves in our own way so mm. yeah i think that your ordeal and everyone else's ordeal that you know that have, have come about from these types of these situations has to teach us something has to teach us something about moving forward yeah yeah i mean i'd like it you know i don't want to sound like i'm, I'm sort of talking about cross purposes but it's lovely to you know when i said when the announcement came out a couple of weeks ago you know, the, the 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 outpouring of support was was wonderful um and i you know i treasure all of those and I, a few of them i kind of messaged back and said listen thank you so much it really does mean the world and and somebody go oh my god you replied and i'm like well yeah you just you know just sent me a really lovely message of course i'm going to just say thank you you know just as you would in the street right um but i think this this sort of instant gratifications of likes defines like I've heard people in, in bars when we could go in bars or coffee shops and you'll have two people sat behind you go, I just put, I put a picture up an hour ago. I, it's only got X amount of likes. And the last one I put up, it got this. And you can see this is, this is, this is sheer terror comes across. And you're like, why don't you put your phone down and speak to your friend who sat next to you? Because you, you're essentially still in that world. You're still living in that world with these worries that you've got, even though you're meeting your friend for a cup of coffee in Costa. It, and the amount of times you've got, I mean, it would be bizarre when we go, when we're eventually allowed to socialise, but when you go in a bar or a pub or something like that and you just see people who are out, particularly if they're having dinner and they're both sat on their phones, you're like, that is bonkers when mm. you think about it. You know, you're, you're out, you've, you've taken the time to put some time together, you've chosen where you're going to eat, you've chosen what, you, way, what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink, and you're not in a moment. You're checking what Alison's shoes look like that she's just bought or, you know, what Tommy's new car looks like. You're like, it's bonkers. I, I, I did a thing. Uh, I came off Facebook for a year and a half. 
Um, and that was quite good, although it wasn't the kind of main one. The problem that I had at the time when I was doing celebs, you have to put up posts about the show. It's not simply mm. you can walk away. You know, it was in our contract that we had to put up a certain amount of posts on social media, primarily Twitter, about the show each day. It was one particular celebrity who who they didn't pay her a full amount because she hadn't engaged on social media enough. It's like, wow. And it was a decent amount of money. You know, it's a, it was like, you didn't engage. So we're, we're, we're not giving you a full fee. But I thought it was kind of interesting when I did it with, with, with FaceTime, with, with Facebook. I just did a couple, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching, it was either a film or, or a football match. And I was, shaken the amount it, it was a tv show because it was adverts and i was shaken that every time the adverts came on my hand would go down and pick my phone up like it was like i, I don't know like it i'd like it was the most natural thing and i was like i was really weary really worried jack i was really shaken so i had a without boring you but not sound like i went and bought a burner phone but i had an issue a couple of weeks ago on my internet and ee sent me a little um wi-fi dongle that you could put and get wi-fi while you don't have it and i said you want the thing back i went no but in fact there's a sim in there it's got 20 quid of credit you know use it for whatever you want so i said to my girlfriend and i said to a couple other people i'm turning my phone off my my actual iphone my regular phone from 8 p.m to 8 a.m but i've got this other number that you can call me in an emergency and there's the key it's like if but you know my mom my mum and dad are in cambridge they're an hour and a half away my girlfriend lives the other side of london in emergency it doesn't mean that you found something really cute on instagram or something it's just like and i've worked out that if i've been doing that for the last month i've worked out if i just turn my phone off in the evening from 8 a.m from 8 p.m to 8 a.m regularly kind of four hours do you know how many months I will save a year for that four hours each day? You've worked it out, haven't you? Two months. Two months, a year. It's 61 days cumulative of those four hours that I won't be looking at my phone. Four hours a day, Jack. Two months. That's crazy. Blew my mind. I did the calculation about five times. I went, it can't be two months. Yes, two months. And then what 60 the, odd days what the question is what could you do with that two to two months that, that you wouldn't have done otherwise imagine the books you could read in that i'm just thinking exactly the same thing what books could you, you know? read what courses what, could you how, do yeah what yeah. what what you know what letters could you write to long lost relatives that you've never you know like it's things that come to mind and the yeah. that's, you're absolutely right it's so easy to just switch our phone off and that's it like you know i i during this record, I put my phone on aeroplane mode because if, just in case something goes wrong or so, you know, something goes yeah, of off course. or whatever, but I use it for kind of notes and questions. But, you know, it's it's actually so nice to know that there's nothing coming in. I don't have to worry mm. about whether the post I put mm. on Instagram this morning has got X amount of likes or whether I've got someone texting me or an email that could come through. And as you said, we are programmed in this life to be so worried about getting back to things as soon as possible. And by yeah. forcing ourselves not to be, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure the first week or two was hard, right? It was. I felt like I was jonesing. I felt like I was going. You know, I felt like I was like sort of shaking. Like that. It, it was insane. It was. But it really that night that I that I was doing this, it really really scared me. And I really, I mean that in the sense, I was like, that is not. That's not even funny. That's not normal. That you're reaching like an addict to your phone. And I remember somebody years ago said about their phone that that when the phone rings or particularly when it when it you know gives an alert or a text message you control the phone the phone doesn't control you it's not the phone doesn't have that stupid little bit of plastic that you've got doesn't control a five foot nine slightly overweight 53 year old with a brain as to when he's going to pick up the phone you know i'm you know i'm not that you know i'm not saying love me love me i'm thick but i'm not letting something like that control my life but it was just like i started doing that and it's really nice i know that the people i love and the people i care about can get a hold of me and you know tomorrow morning and this is sounds insane but tomorrow morning, it's a bit like birthday because you put your phone on, you get ding, ding, ding. And you might have sold something on eBay or you might have, you know, something might. And it's, ah, oh, but you're not getting that over like, you know, up to, until midnight. Because I've been the person that can go, you know, take their phone to bed 
and be on it till like 1 30 just i'm like what are you doing and then you've got you know that's the last thing you see when you go to go to sleep i don't think you sleep properly my sleep pattern over the last couple of weeks i know has been better um so it's 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 important but it does there are some people that that their social media presence and likes is more important than their actual real life. And that's got to change because the, the problem with that is, as I've noticed, as I've found out to my cost, is that that can be a very toxic, a very nasty experience. I think that moving forward, everybody that has listened to this will take something away from it you know the the insights that you know you shared as well as also just the the shit the story that you've told i think is is fascinating as well as also sobering but i think everybody can take a leaf out of your book and say that you know we don't live by our phones and as you said yourself we, we, we're not controlled by them they're not the thing that are that's going to keep us alive and whatever if anything the thing that's going to take us the other way and it and it's and it's and it's just more awareness of this is what's needed and so thank you eden for sharing first of all your story and also your views on what is a very hot topic at the moment and will be i'm sure for for years to come and i just want to personally thank you for sharing your story with me and and my listeners of the show because i think that people will really resonate with what you've been through and hopefully take something away from it to help them in their own journeys and maybe someone else they know that has been through something similar Thank you, Jared. I mean, I would say this, that if you're going through a period where you're, where you're considering ending your life, it is, like I said earlier, it's, it's a permanent, you know, it's a permanent end to a, a temporary situation. And pick that phone up because I know, I know that if I'd have called a couple of people, they would have, they would save my life. And, and thankfully, in some ways it didn't happen but it's not the it's not the answer it's not the answer all you leave is people behind you and you know we talked about mike i barely knew him i mean in the sense that i'd see him i probably film with him for a couple of weeks you know but i spent time with him i grow to become affectionate of him when when he when he took his life it really shook me it really upset me and i've got people that i've never met you know film stars or footballers and they take you know Gary Speed, who played for Leeds, and he's Welsh, and I'm Welsh, and he played for Leeds. So I was, you know, when he took his life, and nobody knows really why. It really upset me, and it, you know, it happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, you just got to speak to someone, and I know that everyone talks about it, but the person on the end of the phone would rather hear from you then than never hear from you at all. You mentioned a couple of charities that helped you through your journey: Calm and the Black. Is it the, the Black Dog? Black Dog, yeah, Black yeah, Dog. Where's, if somebody wants to go and check them out, where is their best, where's the best place to see them? Well, they can, I mean, they're both on, on social media. They're both on um, Twitter and Instagram. They both have their own um, designated websites. Um, you know, uh, Calm, you know, Calm is well known by everyone. Um, Black Dog is quite a new one. Um, they are purely about men's mental health. It was the individual that used to help me on a, you know, sometimes a daily basis that he's involved with them. Um, and they are just there to listen. Um, I think, you know, you've got charities like the Samaritans who are absolutely overrun, I think, and oversubscribed with callers, sadly, particularly in the last, you know, 10 months with, with, with how the world's changed and how insular we've become. And, and picking up that phone is the most important thing. And they're all, you know, if you don't want to speak to a friend, and I totally understand that, then these people are there with no judgment and they are there to, you know, they're, they're one and only job with respect to them. But the one thing they have to do, they're there to do is to help you in your conversation and nothing isn't silly or small because if it's, it's affecting you to the, the stage where you're thinking of ending your life, it is monumental and you need to, to you need to, you need to get some um, help and advice for that. And those two, those two charities for me absolutely saved my life. And if anybody would like to get in touch with you, follow you on socials to see what's up next, because I know that you have got some exciting things in the pipeline, which I'm excited for. Mm. If, uh, yeah. and, and I'm sure mm. that everyone else listening to this will be as well. Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and it's just um, Eden Blackman. That's it. 
Perfect. Please don't troll me. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on that hashtag. Please don't troll me. Yes. No, Eden, yeah. again, thanks so much for this. It's been, it's been a great, great conversation. And I, I've really appreciated your time and energy in telling the story, which I'm sure has been, uh, you know, something that is, has become a, 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 re, a broken record in, in, in your mind as well as in your life. So I'm, I'm glad that you're able to tell it with such passion and energy. And uh, I hope that, you know, this is the, the last that we hear of it in, in the nicest way possible. And mm, um, yeah. I look forward to seeing what's coming next your way and, and hopefully get you on again to talk about that and, and the new pastures in the future. Absolutely. I look forward to that. It, 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 I look forward to speaking to you again because it means, it means I'm here and that's important. Fantastic. Good stuff, man. It was really lovely to speak to you. Take care. Thanks, man. Take care, Jack.